Well, welcome. <laughs> Hi, so uh, welcome to the CMS experiment. You're going to be given a virtual tour today of the, of the detector. And we have your two guide tours here today. My name is Adelina, I'm from Finland, and I'm a researcher at the CMS experiment. And we also have with us... Uh, my name is Karolina, I'm originally from Slovakia, and I'm a safety engineer here working for the CMS safety team. Right. And um, like you said, if you have any questions, you can just ask it at any point. We have about 40 minutes, so don't be afraid. You can ask at any point to make sure that you get all your questions answered. Um, so during today's tour, one of us is going to stay up here on the surface. And the other one, Karolina in this case, is actually going to go down about 100 meters underground to the detector itself in order, in order to show it to you. Um, Might as well just go get ready so I can show you uh, the most exciting part. Exactly. So Carolina is going to get ready. She's going to get on her safety equipment, her, her helmet. You'll see her soon. Um, and also behind the camera, we have our technical team, Sultan and Naomi. You'll see them as well. And they're also will be able to answer any of your questions. They're experts in CMS. <laughs> um, so I think actually to start with, we could show you the slides here um, of the mm -hmm. uh, accelerator uh, infrastructure. So just to give you an idea of where we are at the moment, so what you're looking at here is a map of, um, of the area, of the local area, and you can actually see both Switzerland and France because CERN stretches over both. Um, and uh, the yellow line that you see here is actually the accelerator. You can use the mouse. I can use the mouse, perfect. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> the the accelerator, the Large Hadron Collider, or you might have heard the LHC, which is the abbreviation of it. And uh, located all around it, we have different experiments. So we have, for example, ALICE, CMS, which is where we're currently, LHB, as well as ATLAS. Um, and CMS and ATLAS are the big general um, uh, experiments. So they're looking at lots of different types of new physics. Um, whereas LHB and ALICE are a little bit more specialized in the type of physics that they're studying. So, as I mentioned, we're currently at CMS, up on the surface, um, and uh, uh, the LHE is un actually 100 meters underground. So, while we're up on the surface in the control room at the moment, the actual detector is 100 meters underground um, as well. And uh, let me see if we can go up there. We have the accelerator complex here. Um, yeah, here you can actually see a, a great image of... of um, uh, the yeah. underground structure. So what happens here in the accelerator is that we have actually uh, particles being accelerated both clockwise and anticlockwise up to speeds very close to speed of light. I think it's something like 99.9999991% the speed of light. Um, uh, let me just play this as well. Yeah, actually Carolina is right now walking towards the elevator yeah, yeah. to take her underground. So this is, this is the very first virtue of it from the new control room. Yes. So as they pass through, this is a historical thing. <laughs> OK, go ahead. OK, so uh, while Carolina is walking uh, to the elevator, um, I'll just quickly go through this again. So so we have the particles going clockwise and anticlockwise in this accelerator. Okay. And they actually speed up, sped up to very close to speed of light. And then they collide at these different interaction points where the detectors are located. And during a collision, um, uh, a lot of new particles are created, and these particles traverse our detectors, and then we try to uh, fi uh, figure out what type of interaction just occurred. But it seems like Carolina has reached uh, the first So door. just to explain, uh, right now I am in front of a pad, which is a personal access door. So for me to be able to go underground, I need special access uh, requirements. And uh, for this all to be approved and for me to have special access, I will budge my dosimeter. So this has two purposes. One of it is to um, monitor how much uh, radiation I've been exposed to. And then here we have a device where you put the dosimeter in and you can see uh, the amount of radiation you were exposed to. And then the second purpose of it is it's got a tip in there, which uh, allows me to then access underground. And once... Um, I batch my dosimeter. I will go inside this little uh, cube, and uh, inside there, I will also have my eye sight scan, my eyes. So it really is personalized, and not anyone can just go downstairs with my dosimeter if they wanted to. So um, 
Now, hopefully it will work because sometimes it does get quite funny and uh, it doesn't want to let me in. <laughs> Okay, so right now, Naomi is also passing through the uh, same door as really, you know, just passed through, going through the very exciting writing of scanner. Make sure that only the people with the right access can enter. So at CMS, um, we take security very seriously. You can see the, the safety health. Right, so we were issue. lucky enough to pass through the pads on our first try. And right now we're in a special pressurized area. So we're in one of our two shafts that uh, reach 100 meters underground down to the detector. And uh, over here around the corner, we have our very fast lift that will take us down 100 meters and probably less than a minute. Right now you can see it is on the bottom floor. There's three floors we have here, minus one, minus two, and minus three, which basically almost reaches uh, 100 meters in the ground. So in the meantime, while the lift uh, comes up and uh, we will also reach uh, down underground, uh, you might continue uh, with your presentation if you'd like. Yeah, so while uh, they take elevator, we might also actually lose their connection. I think we can move on to the slides um, because I just shared with you um, a picture of the accelerator structure. But next to, uh, on the, around the accelerator ring, we have these detectors. And this is actually a schematic of the CMS detector. So we are preparing for collisions. We don't have collisions right now, but we will have in a few weeks. So the CMS detector is actually closed up in the configuration it will have um, during collisions. Um, so it can be a bit difficult when you do get to see it, um, uh, to see all these different sub detectors part of the actual detector. So that's why the schematic is great. Um, so on the screen right now, you can also see <laughs> Naomi and Carolina going down uh, with elevator and LS through this connection. I think we just did. Uh, but in the schematic, um, as you see, uh, a person just next to it. This is a kind of a life-size uh, idea so that the, the detector is thank you, uh, uh, detector is very large. So it's actually about uh, 21 meters long and have about 14 meters in diameter. Um, and all these different colors and parts are different sub detectors. And the different sub detectors are specialized in different types of things. Because as I mentioned, we have these collisions in the center of the detector and new particles are created and they traverse the detector. And we want to figure out as much as possible about these particles that are created in the collision. So all these different sub detectors, they're specialized to figure out different things. For example, the precision of the, of the particles, the momentum, the energy, all of these different things that we can actually use to our advantage to, to get an idea of what type of particles were there. So just to give you an idea, um, for example, the charge of a particle, um, uh, we can uh, figure out the charge of the particle by looking at which way the particle traverses, if it kind of turns clockwise or anticlockwise. And this is thanks to the very center of the detector, which has a tracker, where if charged particles move through the tracker, it actually leaves a type of trace. Um, uh, it's actually kind of an electric impulse that we can read out. And by having a very granular tracker, we can uh, trace the path, the trajectory of these particles. Um, but uh, as you might know, particles without the force on them would travel in a straight line. So in order to get this particles to kind of bend either clockwise or anticlockwise to allow us to distinguish between them. We also have an, a, a, electric, a magnetic field in the detector because a charged particle that moves through a magnetic field um, gets cur has a curved uh, trajectory. And the curvature, either turning le left or turning right, depends on the charge of the particle. So by having this magnetic field in the detector and then tracking the particle's trajectories with the tracker, um, we can distinguish if the particle was positively charged or negatively charged. Um, so the tracker is kind of the blue thing you can see here in the center of the diagram. 
And after that, we actually have two things called the uh, uh, calorimeters, the electromagnetic calorimeter and the hadronic calorimeter. And these two are there to measure the energy of particles. So now that we know the charge of the particles, um, uh, we'd like to know the energy of them. And they actually use a very interesting um, uh, technology called uh, scintillators, which work in the sense that when a particle with high energy hits the scintillating material, the energy of this particle actually gets absorbed. And the scintillator then re-emits this energy in a lower type of um, uh, energy in the, in the form of photons. Um, so the energy of these particles can be measured by looking at the photons that are emitted from the scintillating material. Um, so as the particles traverse from the very center of the detector through the tracker, we now know the type of charge you have. By the way, if they don't have a charge, if they're neutral, then they move in a straight line. So that um, uh, helps us as well to figure out um, what type, if they happen to be neutral. Um, Hi. So sorry to uh, interrupt you. Just wanted to say that we made it underground now. Um, we're back uh, on the connection because we do lose connection when we're in the left. So right now we are, um, oh, you can't really see on the left right now because the left is going up, but basically we're 87 meters underground. Um, behind this door, we will have uh, the service cavern. So that is uh, parallel to the experimental cavern. It's a whole area full of uh, rooms that are basically here to support the detector. We will have um, this sec uh, room behind this door will be right under the uh, shaft. So you will probably not be able to see quite up uh, on the surface, but basically that is that exact same shaft where um, you can get up to the surface. And then behind that, there will be a counting room. So that's a room full of computers, which uh, processes the first uh, set of data that comes from the exper uh, experiment, from the de detector itself. So it's gonna be a bit loud, so I hope you'll be able to hear me just right. So there's always some kind of works going around here. So uh, that's what the scaffolding here is for. Uh, the service cavern, especially experimental cavern, they'd be looking almost different uh, every single day because there's something going on. So this is here temporary, but yeah, uh, up here, um, you will have the shaft which goes from the surface uh, 100 meters on the ground. So it is one of the two shafts. This one reaches the service cavern. So that is also where we have the lift to access the underground. And then we have a second shaft, a slightly large, larger one, which goes down to the experimental cavern, which was used to lower the whole detector down underground where you might see pictures here. So this is when uh, it was still uh, built. So this is the shaft, uh, sorry, the experimental cavern, uh, empty without the detector so far. And then here you can see that is the shaft about that size. And um, there was only a few centimeters um, difference uh, from when the detector was being lowered down. So it's very tight size. But uh, yeah, we may continue maybe to the counting room now. So this is one of our two counting rooms. Uh, we've got two of these. Uh, a very similar one to this one is upstairs. Uh, they're both full of these uh, blue electronic racks. So they all uh, go through the first set of data that goes uh, from the detector. There's many, many cables running through exactly into this room and the room upstairs uh, below us. Ah, yes, we can go inside. So also below us here, this is a false floor. So you can imagine a whole maze of cables and they all go into these electronic racks. And then Yeah, we'll just go around. And for these bottles here that you see that are uh, fire extinguishing systems for um, the electronic rack. So like I mentioned before, um, I'm part of the safety team. So you can imagine we take care of 
all sorts of safety systems, uh, everything related to uh, the protection of workers here, their health and safety, as well as the equipment, because uh, these are all very um, useful things that we don't want to get damaged, don't want them to burn, because we would have a lot of probably um, angry physicists that their data is uh, not being um, processed. So yeah, there's many safety systems here. There's specific ones for the racks, there's ones for the rooms, there's really safety is our priority here at CERN. And then under here, the stairs, uh, we can see the whole floor basically that is under the experiment, uh, sorry, under the counting rooms. As you can see, there's many, many cables. Um, it's quite low here. That's why we've got the safety helmets as well to not, to have nothing happen to us. But yeah, so just to kind of give you a picture of what it actually looks like under those floors. And now we may head to the experimental cavern. Just as a last um, comment, behind this red door, you can see, um, you would see the LHC. So that's uh, our largest accelerator, the tunnel. But this is only used for emergency exits. So behind this door, you will find it, but then if uh, people do want to access the tunnel, they will use a different door. But just to kind of give you a picture that the tunnel goes uh, through here and then it goes into the experimental cavern with the beam. Uh, so we'll disconnect again for a couple of minutes because um, we'll be going through another set, uh, door of uh, the personal access door, a pad, and then uh, we'll connect back. So uh, I'll hand it back to you. Thanks, Carolina. As you might have seen just there behind her, there was a kind of warning sign, magnet danger. Um, so the magnet is currently on. Um, as I mentioned, we use this magnet to to uh, figure out first a few things about the particles, for example, the charge of the particles. And the magnet is currently on since we're preparing for new collisions. Um, and this actually means that usually, um, Visitors would not be allowed into the experimental cavern where the detector is, but in this very special case, you're allowed to. So, <laughs> so this is a good opportunity for you. Um, mm -hmm. The magnet is uh, about 100,000 times stronger than the Earth's magnetic field. Um, although, for example, if you would be having some type of medical uh, examination, which uses magnet like an MRI or something, you would probably be in a stronger magnetic field. So it's not necessarily dangerous for people to go there. That's why Carolina and Naomi can go there. But if you would have a medical implant, like an in, uh, like a pacemaker or you know um, something else that could be affected by magnetic field, like your credit card, for example, you do not want to take it in there because it might get uh, damaged by the field. Um, um, so it is safe to go there, but it's still something you need to take into consideration. And I think actually you're going to be able to get an idea of how strong the field is when they go inside into the cavern and you'll see them playing a bit with um, a metal rod to give you an idea of the strength. There, just pass through the door. Yeah, they had to change the camera. They have I mean, to I mean, the camera. Yeah. I mean, the, the mount. Right. They have a special uh, type of mount for the camera, which gets messed up in the magnetic field, right? Yes, <laughs> so, exactly. The gimbal, yeah. <laughs> so they have to change it, and then they'll uh, get back to us. Um, but so what you're about to see as soon as they get back is them entering into the experimental cavern where the detector is. Um, and uh, I think if we get the slide back here while we're waiting for them, um, uh, uh, what you'll see, I, I think I, I'm gonna, I have to warn you so you don't have your hopes up, is not exactly this. Um, because this is kind of a, a cross-sectional view, um, but it's still very exciting, and you'll get an idea of how big the detector is when Carolina stands next to it, which is pretty amazing. I've stood next to it a few times, and it's still hard to believe how big this thing is. Um, but we mentioned a tracker, and we mentioned uh, the magnet, uh, sorry, the color meter, and then the magnets, which are just outside of the of the color meters. And then the final thing, which is actually the bulk of the detector, all of these red as well as yellow parts, kind of orangey parts that you see here, is actually a subsystem meant to measure muons. So muons is a special type of particle. It's 
kind of seen as a sibling to the electron that you might be familiar with, the electron which is part of the atom. Uh, but the muon is um, uh, part of the same family, although um, a little bit heavier. And uh, it's an important part of what we do here at CMS. It's actually even in the name of CMS. Hi, sorry for interrupting. We have a question. Are we okay to ask it now? Yes, yes, please. Yeah. Yes. Omar? Can you hear Omar? Uh, you might, if you could repeat the question. I'll repeat the question, Omar. So how do you aim the particle to collide right at the detector? Right, thank you. So there's actually, I think, I'm not sure if you're able to see in this schematic here, but um, uh, for steering the particles, we actually use magnets. Uh, because as I mentioned, a charged particle like the proton, which is a positive charge, can actually be um, uh, affected by the magnet. There's a force acting in the magnet, which is allows, you, allows you to steer it. So there's magnets all around the accelerator um, ring. And these magnets kind of bend the particle to go in this circular path. And then when we get close to the detector, close to the interaction point, we have another set of magnets. And these magnets are there to really steer and focus the particles so that they uh, collide at the interaction point. And one thing um, I want to say about this, which is it's really, really hard to collide one proton and one proton. So that's not exactly what we do. Instead, we have a lot, a lot of protons. I don't remember the exact num number, but I think it's something like millions of protons. 100 uh, billion. 100 billion. Thank you, so much. 100 billion protons. Uh, and 100 billion protons, and we stare all of these towards each other and hope that a few of them collide. And they do, on average, I think, at, at each type of collision between these two bunches, we have about 50 uh, proton collisions. But it's magnets that actually stare these particles, and it's possible because the protons are charged. It's, I think we can jump back to Carolina. Yep. All right, hi again. Uh, so right now we are over there, we have the door to the experimental cavern. And what I would just like to point out is that what I'm holding right here will be our magnetic field indicator. So right now we have our magnet on, so it's a safe still to go inside, but you will see the magnetic field is quite strong and it will definitely affect this device we have. So if you'll follow me. So again, right now I'm not holding it, it's just hanging there. And then once we go inside, you will see it will actually follow the magnetic field. Okay. So already right now you can see uh, the magnetic field that is following. And of course, behind me, you see the the detector, which is 15 meters in height, which is basically the height of a five-story building. So it is quite large. And then um, at first we'll go up top. So we've got multiple floors here. And uh, yeah, you will get to see it from uh, all the different angles. If we have time, we'll also go down and you will see just quite large it is next to myself. So actually, the, the camera kind of going out of focus at the moment is due to the magnetic field. Um, but it should find focus again, hopefully soon. Great. <laughs> so Carolina is currently walking um, up towards the top of the detector. And so you get a pretty good view of, of what it looks like from, from above it. So when Naomi just turned the camera towards the detector, you kind of saw that it's actually currently in the configuration where it's closed because we're preparing for collisions and it's protected by this uh, steel yoke around it, this orange, red, this red part. Um, uh... So right now we're at the top here. We're on uh, one end of the experimental cavern. So like I mentioned before, Behind this wall, we would have the LHC tunnel. So then the beam pipe runs through the middle, here through the orange shielding, which is here for uh, protection from the radiation. And then it enters the detector, which starts with the 
red wall there, basically. And then above here uh, is the shaft, which was used uh, to lower down the whole detector. So everything you see here was lowered down through that one shaft, which is currently closed now. So you can't access it from the top. There is a whole uh, platform which uh, slides to be either opened or now as it is closed again to protect uh, everyone, everything upstairs from the radiation, which will be here in a couple days or weeks once the experiment starts again. I have a question in regards to the radiation and just in general health and safety. One, has anyone had any, any damage from the radiation? And two, um, what precautions do you have to take if you unfortunately are exposed? Um, so, sorry, um, I must say that down here, uh, it is quite loud in the experimental cavern as we have a uh, lot of equipment running. But uh, from what I kind of caught when, uh, from your question is that um, you were saying if there's any been any cases with the exposure to radiation, is that correct? Yeah, exactly, Carolina. If there's been uh, any cases where somebody got exposed, and also what okay. type of precautions do we take to make sure that, you know, this is avoided at all costs? <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, that's a great question, actually. Uh, so there's, like I said, our safety team, which ensures safety in um, many different aspects, but then radiation, as it is, um, very important to be protected from. There's a whole special uh, department which purely just works on the radiation protection. So they always ensure there's many different uh, devices. I can't see one right now behind me, but there's many of them scattered around in the experimental cavern, which uh, capture the radiation levels throughout the whole year. So right now there's no radiation because there's no uh, experiment running. But once the experiment starts running and the collisions will be happening inside here, the radiation levels are very, very high. So there is no access into the experimental cavern and everything is very highly regulated. So in case there are any repairs to be done that someone needs a short access inside, it goes through many people, including the experts from the radiation protection team. So uh, I haven't been here long enough to know of any incidents, but uh, as far as I know, anyway, there have been no incidents because it really is um, something that is... Uh, taking care of, uh, I mean, by that, the safety and uh, especially radiation protection. So I hope I answered your question with that. Um, now we'll uh, go slowly down. So we'll go kind of around the detector. So like I think it was already mentioned, uh, the detector is fully closed now because it is uh, prepared for the experiment. But the CMS is designed in uh, 15 slices. And these slices can be moved. So um, just a few weeks ago, we uh, had the detector opened and that is for uh, people to access uh, the inside. So if there's any repairs to be done, maintenance, or uh, even some uh, new things were installed, some new chambers to be tested. So all of this was uh, possible because the detector can, uh, these slices can be sl slided uh, and the detector will be opened. So just from here, I can show you the size. So from this pillar here to this one, that would be one slice. And now when it is closed, oh, my wrench just got stuck. <laughs> you can see um, it is really closed, so it's sealed off. Um, and then also now with this one, as we're really close to the detector, um, it is honestly very strong, like it's hard for me to even try to bend it in the other direction. And then you will see as we pass through, it will also change the position of it. I'll go a bit slower. So now you can really see which way the magnetic field is. So it is honestly a very, very strong magnet we have in there. It is the strongest of its kind. As you can see, it just fully turned around before it was pointing like that. And then also now for the closure of the experimental cavern, 
uh, probably about two weeks ago, we had a deep clean of the experimental cavern. There was many volunteers uh, running around with uh, backpacks uh, as a Hoover. And we had to clean the whole uh, whole place. Uh, that's for two reasons. So also the dust, uh, if there was any dirt here, it, um, it would be bad for the detector. So there would uh, be some uh, kind of like interruptions. And then also, secondly, we had uh, everything you see here is um, materials that do not interact with the magnetic field because uh, if there was anything, it would move uh, and be influenced by the magnetic field. So it really needs to be kind of cleared out, cleaned out, so that we're set for the ex uh, experimental phase. I think that was a great picture, by the way, where you saw the orange beam pipe that goes into the center of the detector, as Carilla mentioned, which is currently protected um, off. So the beam pipe actually is, is a lot smaller and the bulk of that is the protection. But you can see how it goes towards the center of the detector. And there's an identical one on the other side of the detector. So we have these two beams, one going clockwise, another one going anticlockwise, which then collide at the very center. Right, so right now I am standing at the bottom uh, on the floor here of the detector. So right now I'm standing about 100 meters underground. Um, as I said, it reaches up to 50 meters in height and uh, is quite much taller, larger than myself. Again, uh, once I get closer, to the detector, you can also see this moving in the magnetic field. And then especially if you come up closer, you see many, many cables, which always fascinates me. Uh, that in every single cable is uh, calculated to have an exact length. So, because also you have to uh, imagine that when the detector is being moved, none of the cables are being uh, disconnected. So every single cable that you see here stays intact. The whole detector is all connected up and still they're able to move the detector because every single cable is calculated in length so that we're able to do this. I think since we're quite limited in time, in case you have any more questions, please feel free to ask them while, uh, while the tour is still going. Um, And also just one thing to show you when I mentioned about the moving of the slices of the detector, uh, these orange discs that you see, those are used for the movement. So um, there's air that's being um, blown out that is filled and uh, it basically lifts up the detector slightly. Basically, it just compensates for the friction because you can imagine uh, it's got, it's very, very heavy, it's very tall. So if you were to just move it, it might tilt slightly and uh, everything's very tight in there. So it could uh, damage the beam pipe and we definitely don't want that. So the movement of these slices uh, really take um, several hours uh, so that we're being careful. Uh, these, uh, it's being lifted slightly up while air is being blown out for to compensate for the friction. And then uh, just behind here, you can also see what is being used for to pull these slices. You honestly need uh, some very, very strong cables here you can see. So this was just used a couple of weeks ago. Robbie, yeah, I'm afraid so... we didn't hear the question. Yes, could you please repeat? That's okay. That's okay. I didn't want to interrupt. Go on, do you want to ask the question again? Uh, so... Did you hear that? Could you I can repeat it. Yeah. yeah, so it says earlier on you mentioned that the 
saying her dog has a lot that similar qualities to an MRI scanner. Yes. Did you have any influence within the, the MRI scanner as a as an organization? As far as I know, not with the MRI, no. But uh, no. but CERN does influence other medical devices, and one of them, for example which is not to mention is the PET scanner. So there's the, the uh, positron electron uh, scanner, which can kind of, um, uh, it's, it's a thing that's used in medical field to give an uh, idea of, for example, if you have a tumor somewhere like in the brain. Um, and the way, the reason why CERN was able to kind of influence this technology is because it uses actually an uh, electron positron, uh, it uses a beam, an electron beam that, uh, um, uh, uh, can be sh uh, shut into the brain. It sounds very <laughs> dramatic, um, but basically this uh, involves electron acceleration and particle mm -hmm. acceleration is something that CERN obviously is uh, uh, a leader in this type of technology um, and could therefore be helpful then developing this type of medical device. Uh, but I think also there's other medical devices that CERN also uh, works with, but the one that I can distinctly remember is the PET. Uh, kind of... We also have another question. Am I okay to ask that now? Yeah. Did you hear that, or would you like me to repeat? No, Could you no. repeat, please? So you have a collision planned in the next couple of weeks. He asked, "What are you planning to?" Um, so repeat that again, Yusuf. What are you planning to, what are they planning on studying as a result of this most recent experiment? Right. So CMS is like a general purpose experiment. So we actually, I mean, we'd like to study everything. <laughs> so um, uh, we do have a type of uh, physics, um, uh, um, a, a certain, certain type of physics that we uh, plan for that we want to look into. Um, so it's not like, well, I guess in some cases, we're actually just simply looking for anomalies. So for example, if something looks different than what we would expect, um, but there's many uh, uh, different groups at CMS that look into special type of new physics, or even just also precision experiments. So quite often, uh, instead of looking specifically for a new type of physics, you can also try to measure the type of physics we know of, but very precisely. And if it then differs, from what our theory tells us, then we know that we have to adjust our theory because the theory isn't correct. And I guess in a way you can say that that's a new physics because it's physics that doesn't agree with the theory that we have. Um, but lots of exciting stuff. There's people looking for dark matter candidates. You might know of dark matter, this type of uh, matter, which is the majority in the universe that we don't know much of. That's what we call it dark. It's kind of mysterious. <laughs> um, uh, but there's lots of people looking for dark matter candidates. Um, uh, people looking for things that could explain gravity or could explain um, uh, the start of the universe, um, the reason why we have this uh, imbalance between matter and antimatter. There's lots of things going on in parallel. And Carolina, are you coming back up no, to the surface? She is, she is just lost at this moment. But okay, we lost her. <laughs> she's just coming back to the surface. That's okay. While she's lost, we have a lot of students who are dying to ask questions. So oh, great, I'm great, great, absolutely. I've, I've got an order, so I'm going to go. Oh, um, I have a question about what are the AMI works? Like, like, what are the AMI works? Like, like? I'm going to repeat. What does a day in the life look like for you working at CERN? Oh, okay, for me specifically. <laughs> so, uh, so at CERN, we have so many different people with different disciplines. Like, for example, I'm... Uh, currently doing a PhD in applied physics, and Carolina is working with with safety at CMS. We have technicians, engineers, researchers, all kinds. In my case, um, I work mostly with software. So I think it depends a lot if you work with software or with hardware. But in my case, it would be uh, pretty similar to what you imagine somebody working with software engineering. Um, what they would, what they, what their day would look like a lot, you know, in front of the laptop coding. Um, um, but because uh, CERN and CMS is so large, there's a lot of collaborations. So almost every day we'll have meetings with across the globe. Many of my collaborators are in the US, for example, in Chicago. Um, so a lot of collaboration, um, but a lot of working on the laptop. But I think, for example, like people like Sultan who work with hardware, 
me working with software would think that their days were exciting. <laughs> <laughs> Being with the detector, actually getting to work, putting their hands on the detector itself. Yeah. I think, Carolina, is there something? Yeah, I don't know. Are you ready to go on that? So we can hold back on the questions for now. Um, yeah, yeah, go on. Um, go on with the if questions. you've got any questions, though, then definitely do ask. Uh, don't don't uh, be shy. But maybe one thing that I would like to just point out real quick is uh, this uh, man here with half a body. <laughs> He's wearing our safety mask. So for you to have uh, what I mentioned before, to have access into underground, both the service and experimental cavern, you need to go through many trainings. And one of them is uh, the self rescue mask, which is a in class uh, training and. Uh, you get some theory behind it, and then you also have a practical part, which is the test, where you need to put one of these self-rescue masks on. And you have about 30 seconds to put it on for you to pass the test, because in real life, if there was any gas leaks or a fire and you would have smoke, this self-rescue mask would give you roughly about half an hour of oxygen. So uh, this is especially very useful if you're in the tunnel. There is only several access points, and then you could... Uh, be walking for 10, 20 minutes to actually get out of the underground up to the surface. So this self-rescue mask with uh, the half an hour of oxygen would just save your life. So it's very useful to uh, to know how to put it on. So then we have a simulated kind of in real life um, experience where it's all uh, there's a replica of the tunnel and then also a, a replica of like a gas kind of they just have some smoke coming out but nothing harmful obviously but just to kind of put you in that type of stressful situation where you only got 30 seconds to pull this on and there's quite a few steps to put it on right so um, it was quite a fun exercise though to be fair so that's what this guy shows here that um this uh, the self rescue mask is uh, what you might have to use. And here at CMS, we've got some of them in our red uh, cabinets. So in case uh, there was any kind of emergency, people can find them in here. But um, no one's been having to use them. Apparently, once there was an um, emergency where someone panicked and uh, put on a mask, but that wasn't uh, really for. Um, like there wasn't actual uh, any gas leaks. He just heard the fire, uh, the fire alarm, panicked and put it on. Which I mean, safety first. So he oh. did the still the right decision, even though it wasn't the really necessary. But rather be safe than sorry. But yeah, now we'll be heading back upstairs. So back through the counting room in the service cavern, uh, to the left, uh, and then the. Uh, We'll meet you upstairs in a few minutes and uh, definitely for now, just uh, ask any questions. Yes, sorry. I think uh, if you had any more questions, then please. I'll be on hand for the piece. <laughs> I didn't hear that myself, so I'll repeat that. So why are we going to the Okay, so why are only 12 visitors, 12 maximum people allowed in the experimental cabin? I think more is allowed. That's for visitors, is that correct? 12 people? We have for visitors only 12. Yeah. For for people, we, we also have a maximum. So, I mean, workers, people. We also have a maximum, mm -hmm. but this maximum is limited by the 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 um evacuation path it is also limited probably you saw that these two ladies went in by a key access of course this key is a is a safety uh thing uh if you take a key that physically hardware wise blocks the accelerator from putting in beams in the machine mm -hmm. so obviously we can allow as many people, maximum as many keys we have, and I think 80 keys we have uh, uh, available. <clears throat> but of course, uh, in the, the 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 bottom line is that more people needs more time to evacuate. It's more complicated. Just think of the 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 airplanes evacuation things. So obviously, we just want to be on the safe side. And you have another question? Can you explain the concept of 
Well, that's a very big question. <laughs> and can you explain the role of antimatter and its role of its role within physics at CERN? So for well, physics at CERN, okay. Right. <laughs> so I'm not an antimatter expert. We are rather keen on having antimatters, of course. Uh, the CMS main uh, uh, objective is not to create the antimatter. There are several other different experiments at CERN who are making antimatter, antihydrogen, and try to compare its uh, pro uh, uh, um, properties to that of the ordinary matter, as we call. Actually, with antimatter, there is a there is a slight ambiguity in, in physics that we see. Down below our feet, if we make a physics uh, uh, experiment, I mean co collide protons and, and another proton, and create energy and then create back matter from the energy, we always create the same amount of matter and antimatter. That seems to be law of the nature. However, if we look at the sky, or we just... We just consider that we are discussing about antimatter today. It means that in this region where we are in this control room, in this on this globe, in this galaxy, we have a matter dominance. We don't have antimatter around. You can imagine that if there would be antimatter, if uh, uh, Adelina would be made of antimatter and we would just uh, shake the hands, it would be uh, quite dramatic uh, for the day. So I would, uh, I we can be sure that uh, she is made up of the same type of matter as I'm made of. Uh, we know that you made of the same matter as 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 we are. But you know, in the particle experiments, we see something contradicting. We create the same amount of matter and antimatter. Now the question is, since we don't know what is the mechanism to separate matter from antimatter, we try to figure uh, out if there is difference in the properties. So that's what these experiments like the alpha does, uh, uh, creating antihydrogen and dropping the antihydrogen, for example. This is not a simple dropping, but of course, uh, making uh, looking at the gravity. What is the gravity's effect on this? This is something very fascinating that, that if the gravity would in interact differently with matter and antimatter, that would give us a... a um, an explanation why the, the galaxy has the matter dominance. That would be that somehow the gravity would would filter out. But as far as I know, the result is no. They are same, same what concerns the gravity uh, interaction. We don't know yet why the universe looks like this. We don't know if the matter and the antimatter are different in something really tiny. We don't look at it yet. Or during the Big Bang, somehow a little bit more matter was created than antimatter. We don't know the mechanism how it could happen. We have no idea, but this could also lead to this end uh, status where we are now. I think what I heard that if uh, one uh, um, matter would be made, one matter access would be made on every one billion and uh, antimatter matter per creation, then we would see the universe like this now. Sorry to interrupt you. I just really quickly wanted to point out that right now we're on the surface and just looking down through the uh, shaft down into the service cavern, the one I mentioned to you before when we were just uh, underground. So just wanted to explain what you are looking at currently. But yeah, continues all time. I'm sorry, I did not want to interrupt there. I think we could move on to another question. Since yeah, yeah, it seems yeah, yeah. like we had a lot of them. Okay, so again, do you want me to repeat? Uh, yes, yes. Yeah, so you said you had 100 billion photons runs into another 100 billion photons. He asked, where did you actually get the photons from? Sorry, where do we get the protons? Is that the question? Yes, right. that was the question. Okay. We might have a schematic, but um, yeah. So actually, the actually I do have a schematic. But, um, okay. um, of uh, uh, the particle structure. But essentially, to answer your question, it actually starts with hydrogen. 
So hydrogen is the simplest element. It's the atom is just made up of, of one proton, a neutron, and we have an electron. And actually, the way that we get the protons is that we, uh, yes, okay, we do have a, a picture here now. <laughs> um, uh, we actually start with the hydrogen bottle, and we put them to, yes, early back. <laughs> we put them to something called a dual plasma trans. It actually turns the hydrogen into plasma, and then we strip the electrons out of these plasma, and then what goes forward is simply the protons. So it's actually quite simple. You know, everything yeah. seems to be so complex here, but in the case of how we get the protons, it's just simply from a hydrogen bottle like the one you see here. And this dual plasma trans is, is practically a microwave oven. <laughs> okay, uh, practically a microwave <laughs> oven, as also said. <laughs> just, we just heat it up, oh, actually not heat up, but we use high voltage to create this plasma. And then we just have a uh, positively charged thing around virus that pulls off the electrons and left is only the protons moving forward into our accelerator. <laughs> Thank you so much. Well, do you have any more questions? Thank you. Um, I'm aware of the taking place. Did you hear that? I thought that was a big question. Is that what the other I'm going to Um, to what extent? I don't know if this is true, but um, I heard that there was a man who did not know that the particle accelerator was actually taking place, and ended up ended up having it passed down to him his brain. Um, apparently he did survive, but only experienced like severe problems later. You know what? You know, I've heard I've heard this same story, and I'm not sure. Yeah, we've all heard it. Yeah, all heard it. yeah and I this think happened. Sultan this was, happened. Yeah, you know. This happened in 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 the Soviet Union, I think in in Dubna probably, many many years ago, 60, 70 years ago. This was a, a clear violation of safety, and we all learned about it. This is something that we want to avoid at any cost. And that's why you saw that uh, we have access systems. Uh, you saw how the ladies go through the the uh, access pads. You probably saw the key access. Uh, we talked about that how the accelerator is physically blocked from injecting a particle, injecting a proton while people are in there. So that's definitely that we want to avoid, and we all our safety rules are are made to avoid this, even accidentally. Yeah, like often is the case here. We learn from past mistakes, not always that we made, but you know, you, you want to learn from every type of mistakes that's been made by other people too. So it's definitely something that wouldn't happen here now, given yeah. a lot of safety uh, measurements we take into place. Okay, thank you. We have another question. Um, are there any opportunities for students to get involved with SIM? Uh, who to get involved? Students. students to get yeah. involved. Yes, uh, there's many opportunities, actually. Um, and it depends what type of student. But for example, if you are a, a bachelor student or type of, yeah, type of bachelor student, you can come here in the summer, for example. There's a summer student program, which you can learn more about. If you Google certain summer students, you can spend three months here at CERN and work actually with particle physics yourself. Um, as a master's student, you can come as a technical student. This is something I did myself, actually. Um, and then there's also the opportunity to do a PhD at CERN. Um, I think also th there's plenty more programs, actually, although this might uh, require more that your school is involved with CERN. But there's often uh, uh, students that come to CERN and spend two or three weeks here um, working on something specific. But I would say in your case, as an as an individual, if you're interested yourself, then definitely Google either certain summer student or certain technical student. And, and beamline for schools. Beamline for schools. For schools. Yeah, that's okay. that's a that's a, com a competition for for secondary school uh, uh, students proposing experiments, and the winner can really make the experiment not only at, at here at at CERN. This is also possible with protons. But also the DAISY in Hamburg is involved now. So, so th th there is another group is selected for, for the DAISY. This happens to be a very, very uh, uh, interesting and, and a very, very popular uh, contest. 
for for people, the students who are interested in physics. Uh, at the of end, course, at the end yeah. Sorry. This, sorry. At the end of this, could you send me through any that might be relevant to our secondary students, so we know we're directing them in the right way? Um, I think. A lot of I think. Yeah, yeah. We can we can add these on the Indico page. That would be very yeah. useful. I will ask the, the back office to do so and add all these informations on there. That, uh, that's, 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 that's quite important. Yeah. Well, I that's would great. also just like to point out that um, you don't have to be a physicist directly oh, yeah. here at CERN, because myself as an engineer, I always had that picture in mind that you, um, it's physicists mostly working here, but actually there's many, many engineers as well as physicists, of course, and uh, different professions here as well. So definitely also as a student, you can get involved. Uh, some machine programs, like you mentioned, uh, I heard are very, very good. Um, the students always really appreciate it, get to work a lot, but also get to really get a good experience here at CERN because you're here in general the summertime. Summertime is very nice in the area. And um, myself as a technical student, um, it's I've been learning a lot. So if it is something you might consider in the future, once you go to university, it is a uh, very, very good. I highly recommend. Yes, definitely, definitely. And what's more, um, as you said, not only physicist is needed, and and I would just broaden it. All kind of engineers as well. Yeah. So it's not just a electronic engineer or a programmer. We we do need the the IT as well and the electronics as well, but. Believe or not, we do need the mechanical engineers. You saw the structures. They are very, I would say, that very unusual structures that we have. So this is really a challenge in mechanical engineering. And also, we need the civil engineers. You saw the underground zone. So this is, again, something that is uh, quite uncommon in the normal life. So everybody who is interested in, in accepting the challenges and, and likes to do uh, interesting things. Welcome. Thank you. Sorry, we're going to move on to another question. Our students have to go back to class in the next 15, so, and I know there's quite a few that want to go through. Should they? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, that's a really good question. So she was just wondering, what's the difference in the terms from CMS and to Alice? Like, the, both of the terms are being used, but we just... Is CMS and... Then, so she just wants to know what CMS fully stands for. What CMS stands for? CMS stands for oh, compact, so compact muon solenoid. Yeah, compact muon so it's, solenoid. it's compact, it's small. You see that the person, oh yeah, sorry, that, that mouse. The the person mm -hmm. is like this, and, and you saw the, the dimensions uh, with respect to Carolina's dimensions. She's a normal human, not smaller. So the, 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 the experiment is something like 15, 16 meters uh, high. Well, we call it diameter, and about 20 meters long. Uh, the atlas, the other uh, general purpose particle physics detector, a toroidal LHC apparatus. Sorry, okay. <laughs> that's uh, uh, that's a, a different size. I would say twice in in each dimensions. The difference is made up of of uh, how do we make the mirror momentum measurement low field longer flying uh, stronger field shorter flying i do not want to go into this that would take a, a a long explanation i love to do that by the way uh so um they are they are made for 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 uh, uh particle for proton proton collisions mainly and uh, searching for new physics beyond the the, the standard model of physics um, the two others, the ALICE and LHCB, are tuned a little bit differently. The ALICE is uh, ion uh, yeah, uh, a uh, LHC ion collision experiment, I think, um, is used for heavy ion collisions. For one month every year, we collide not only protons, but, uh, but lead ions, or sometimes something else as well, lead ions to each other to... To, to look for the properties of the this very strange uh, the status of the matter we call quark gluon plasma when when all the particles dissolve and only at their constituents uh, uh, happen to stay in a soup for a very short moment and that's what we believe that happened at the very early universe 
so its uh, its impact on our life is quite high. So that that's what uh, this, this this detector was uh, built for that. But apart from this, both Alice and uh, Atlas and CMS participates in the heavy ion uh, program as well. So we also detect it, but our detector is tuned for rather for proton proton collisions and not like heavy ion collisions. The LHCb is looking for a very uh, well, the B there means B quark physics, uh, looks for the strange things of the, of the uh, related to the B quarks, the, the CP asymmetry of, the, of, of physics. I do not want to go into, into this, but, but this is for something very interesting part of the, the, the physics. What you might see that the geometry of the LHCB is a little bit different from the other three. Um, the other three was built to cover fully the uh, the space around the full four pi uh, solid angle, as we call the the full space around the collision point. Why the LHCb is just you can you can imagine that this is just a wedge of them. This is enough to make high resolution resolution physics results there as well. In our case, since we are looking for something that might pop up. We want to look at the full uh, four pi solid angle. Sorry for the short, uh, for <laughs> long, <laughs> not very short explanation. That's okay. We, I'm just going to move on to the next question. That microphone doesn't work very well, I think. So, so uh, Robbie, if you can just just relay the, uh, the the question, that would be. Uh, the question she asked was on for very long. I'm going to answer that one for uh, later, but I've moved it on to another student. Sorry, just one second. The microphone's mainly for me, so I can hear them clearly. Yep. <laughs> So you use your experiments, you are usually looking for anomalies to disprove current theories. What have been the most current theories that you have either disproved or new theories that you have proved? Oh yeah, this is a great question. <laughs> I mean, I think there are a lot of things going on all the time. So for example, there's new publications coming out every week. CMS is a huge experiment with 10,000 of people working here. Um, one of the, the biggest uh, uh, discoveries is the one that you probably heard of that's often talked about, the Higgs boson, which is kind of actually the reason why CMS was created, at least part of the reason for CMS wanted to explore many avenues of new physics, but the Higgs boson was uh, one of those, um, uh, a bigger of those. Um, so the Higgs boson is this particle that um, uh, through a mechanism provides mass to some of the fundamental particles. And this is kind of this big missing piece of the puzzle of the standard model um, that was actually discovered in 2012. And since then, we've learned a lot more about the Higgs boson. And actually in my case, I work with Higgs physics. So that's maybe the thing that I'm most familiar with. Um, but I don't know, can you think of something else that CMS has currently Oh yeah, something like two hundred <laughs> minimum <laughs> uh, decay channels. As we just discussed, so what we know about uh, uh, we we know very much of the standard model now in physics in total, but we also know that this mustn't be the final theory of everything. There are several several questions emerge: the mass differences of particles, the the the, the fermion boson duality, the missing of a dark matter yeah. that we know that it should be there. We know it from astronomy. So so something else completely different. We, we, we know that there are things that cannot be described within the standard model that we know today and, and teach at the university. So we are looking for hints or glimpses of the, the physics, as we call physics beyond standard model, so the new physics. Um, and there are lots of uh, lots of theories as well. So you can you can fill the cupboard with theories, of course, and they they can make predictions that we could 
uh, observe or or not observe. Um, either we can observe a, a new particle like like the Higgs was also predicted in in one of these uh, these theories, and we found the Higgs particle. But we could also see small deviations from from the physics that we can describe the standard model. If we see these small deviations, uh, that might be the the footprint of something else beyond the standard model. Um, it's I know it's very cryptic, but let me just tell a story about it, and then I will I will shut up. I promise. Uh, before the Higgs was discovered in the 90s, early 2000s, there was a very nice accelerator in Fermilab, the Tevatron, that could create uh, very energetic collisions of protons. And they, in the, the top quark uh, decay, they saw something a little bit of a difference from the standard model. The, even that time, we knew that this should be something uh, uh, with the Higgs. And we saw something similar here on the large, large electron positron collider. But of course, so that was just a hint. It, it was, as we call, an indirect uh, uh, observation or indirect channel. We are looking for now for indirect things. In order to get these indirect findings, we need statistics. So all these. Uh, findings we can make on a statistical base, and we can see tiny little deviations from the the canonical model, the standard model now, and the beyond the standard model if it exists. And that's that's the main aim today. What we are looking for. As Sultan mentioned, we work very close to be theorists, uh, phys uh, uh, theoretical physicists mm -hmm. who who come up with. Um, uh, predictions of what we might see in the detector if this type of new physics exists. So a lot of what the type of physics we do here is trying to look for signatures uh, which were predicted by these theories. Amazing, thank you so much. And um, Majef? Yeah, what can you about the paper? Yeah, what career pathway did you take? So what subjects did you study? Um, from school to, we call them our A-levels, maybe your furthers to university. And I know that there's obviously different routes within the engineering, but particularly, what routes did you guys take? Yeah, I think, first of all, there's so many different routes. And when you talk with people here, everybody seems to have a different path here. So don't feel like, you know, uh, there's only one way to get to CERN. Even if, let's just, if you, even if you're just talking about physics, even in physics, you can take many very, very different um, different type of paths. In my case, uh, I studied physics for my bachelor, and then for my master's, I actually did computer science. Uh, and I came as a technical student in IT to CERN. Um, but then through my connections, and I was working kind of like with IT as well as with the experimental physics group, I actually was approached about doing a PhD, which kind of um, was half software, half physics. And that's what I ended up doing. So it was kind of a path which was kind of, I had the physics background, but then actually when I um, did my master's, I got more specialized in computer science, specifically machine learning. And that's kind of how I ended up here. Uh, for myself, it's also quite a, um, you could say, unusual path like for yours, I would have uh, also never guessed. So um, I went on to university to study biomedical engineering as my bachelor, which I am actually still currently uh, doing in Scotland and uh, I got the opportunity to do a year in industry here at CERN and um, working in safety which is obviously not quite the same as biomedical engineering but that quite a few overlaps and uh, as long as you work hard and you really do um, enjoy the work I'm sure you will be able to get these opportunities here at CERN and like you mentioned there is no specific path that you really do have to take to Make your way here. Yep. Thank you. Uh, hello. Yeah, so it's asking about your electricity bill, really. <laughs> How much energy do you use? <laughs> I can um, tell. Okay, so also knows the number. I know the number. <laughs> so if everything works, the accelerator complex, this is not just one accelerator, not just the LHC, but we have lots of other things. Uh, the accelerators, the detectors, uh, um, 
even my computer in my office and the, the lights, we eat something like uh, about 170, 190 megawatts, which is something like a city of, uh, of 200,000 people. So we are not eating extra large amount of energy. And I know about the urban legends that we probably have a nuclear power plant uh, hired somewhere in France. No. Uh, indeed, we buy the electricity from the EDF, the, the French uh, network provider. We bring it in as a 400 kilovolt network. Well, we are one of the three of, of the French consumers who, who get the 400 kilovolt network beyond the defenses. But indeed, um, we... We, we eat a normal electric power from the normal national grid. And the consumption is, uh, I would say, not extremely high. So it is uh, comparable to that of, I think, half of a normal nuclear power plant reactor. This is not a, not a big deal. 200,000 inhabitants. I think that's worth it. Also, if you came here to CERN, you would notice that it is kind of like a small city, at least like a village. You know, we have our own, we have like a bank, a post office, everything. So it's kind of like, <laughs> like you have your own little city here. Um, that's that's a nice, normal size city, I would yeah, say. Yeah. So uh, we have something like, during summer especially, we have uh, a couple of thousand people on site at the same time. Mm -hmm. We have something like 15,000 users, and we have about 2,000 staff. Of course, not they are, they are not always on, on site, all the 17,000, but indeed, uh, many users come here during, the, during the, the university break periods. So that's of course. Most of us are, are somehow linked to universities, not me. Yeah, but so, so users are somebody who works at CERN, but more like in a... Uh, you know, collaboration. So they're not specifically employed by CERN, but they're employed by universe by their university or institute, mm -hmm. which then sends them to CERN to do technical work or how does that work here? Um, yep, yep, yep. Not so all of majority. us are not all of us are employed. I think none of us are employed. I am employed. Probably. Yeah, you, you are. <laughs> okay, <laughs> we 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 too not. <laughs> this is just moving on from that question. Do you have any specific universities that you're aligned with? So many. <laughs> at, at CMS, we Since have more than 150 40. universities all around the globe who are involved. So I would say that very close to you, there should be someone who are involved. Um, I was lucky because my university was involved when I was a student. Actually, we just started the collaboration with CERN at that time. But, uh, but indeed, uh, we have so many university relations. If I'm just talking about just CMS, if you put into Atlas and the other experiments and not only LHC experiments, I would say that somehow every university is all around the world where that is physics. Mm -hmm. I think somehow they are involved. Okay, great, thank you. Ryan? I was wondering um, if wonder, he's wondering in general where does the funding come for for CERN? Is it is the government or is it donations? Is it universities? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, the it. funds. Uh, these are so actually we we get our money from the. The uh, national uh, research funds of the universities or, or the, the 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 countries participating through their universities. I would say this is government fund usually, but in, not in that sense that you ask. So we are not researching, doing research for any military things. That's one of our basic rules when the CERN was founded 70 years ago, by the way, this year, uh, this was one of the one of the principiums that we just uh, defined that we are not participating in any military uh, researches. But that's government money, taxpayers money. I think I would say this way. Yeah, and one of the ways that then the, the countries that um, 
uh, uh, you know, provide someone to discern some of the things that they get back, of course, is that the people from their country, like for example, Finland, they can send some of their citizens there to get educated at CERN. For example, I was a technical student and now a doctoral student at CERN, so I've learned a lot here. And then, of course, there's a chance of me going back to the country I came from and, you know, helping with the industry there, bringing the knowledge that I was taught at CERN. Um, so, of course, there's many benefits mm. of being a member state and um, uh, being part of CERN. Actually, this is this is another principium that we that we made when the CERN was funded, that everything, every information that we create here, every knowledge, we put back to the society in the closest way. Uh, for this, there are several ways. One is that we welcome students here, and when they go back home, they they continue their researches. Also, we have. Quite a, quite a nice outreach programs at CERN. We uh, welcome something like 100,000 visitors per year. We have about 30,000 visitors per CMS per year, and we have several thousand, almost the same as 30 of the virtual visits per year. So this is something, a direct uh, uh, feedback to the, to the society of what we have. And also, we, we make uh, trainings for teachers, physics teachers, every year. We have, I think, more than 30, 35 uh, physics, training, uh, physics teacher training courses at, uh, during the year. Uh, so we, we try, to, try to feed back all this information that we create here, all these research results to the society. We are absolutely open. Great. So uh, we've got five more questions. I'm going to cap it there because our students keep asking. I'm going to leave it at five. <laughs> just to let them. Um, great. Uh, um, it says, on average, how long does it take for the for the collaborative collaboration of physicists to study the most recent collides that you're doing? So the next one that's coming up, will it be something that is studied for numerous years? Is it ongoing research? Or is well, it... And that yeah. is time um, set. So there's a wide range. So quite, sometimes the research starts immediately, but in many cases, we're still looking into data that was collected in 2016, 2017. So there's things that, um, you know, the first time you look at the data, you might get a, a good idea of what you're looking at and you publish the results that you have with the precision you get at the moment. But then other physicists and other groups might come back a few years later and be, okay, we now have more sophisticated tools to analyze this data with, and therefore a better precision in the results. And now we're gonna look into this again and see uh, what type of results do we get now with our uh, tools that have, uh, which are improved and therefore would improve our results. So I would say that it's a kind of a continuous research. It starts as soon as we get the data, but we have the data stored. So all of the data we ever collected, we still have it left. And uh, we can continue to study it throughout mm. many, many years and always you know, find new things, yeah. find out new things. Stuff. But before we get there, in order to, to, to sketch up a new accelerator and its detectors, mm. it takes decades. Mm. So um, I know when the CMS was uh, uh, first sketched up was in 1993, good 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, this was done because by that time, there was a decision at the, the CERN Council that a new accelerator is going to be built that's called Large Hadron Collider. Uh, let me just recall that uh, uh, the previous accelerator, the Large Electron-Positron Collider, started to operate only in 1989. So we are just talking about exactly the same time when you when you start an accelerator, you are already thinking of a new one because it's building, it's, mm -hmm. uh, it's research and, and creating its technology. Then to build the accelerator and also to build the detectors and develop them, it takes decades. Mm -hmm. Now we are talking about the new accelerator, the uh, uh, Future Circular Collider. At, this is at this moment, this is its uh, work name. Uh, this is, if this will be happened, if this will be approved by the, the money makers, uh, it will start to operate something like 2070 with its detectors. So I would say that's well beyond my reach in, in my lifetime. By the time I will be something like 100 years old. Um, 
Okay. Um, so I would say that that we are talking about really long projects. Uh, we are talking about the LHC. As I told you, the LHC was started to be thought of at the beginning of the 1990s. And very probably this will be with us, at least according to the latest decisions, we are going to operate beyond 2040 as well. Uh, my personal feeling is that this 40 will be 50. So uh, up to 2050, for sure, uh, these uh, this accelerator and these detectors are going to run. We are going to make statistics. We are going to, to look for the indirect channels minimum, unless we find something uh, surprising. And then we will start the new accelerator that will take us to the 22nd century or something like. And it's interesting at this point, when we start the new accelerator, it's not like the LHC becomes just, you know, it's not like we just put it to the side and never use it again. Yeah. But as is the case with the other accelerators that become for the LHC, they actually become part of the accelerator structure so that the protons, for example, they start accelerating into smaller rings. As you can see here, there's some dates next to these rings. And that's actually at which point this type of um, accelerator was being used or when it came into use. Mm -hmm. um, so whenever we get a new accelerator, we kind of <laughs> downgrade the current one to be just like the starting point. An injector. In injector. <laughs> um, so yeah, very sustainable of us. Yeah. You know, so we use everything. So thank you. And we're going to do one final question just because of our timing. Yes. Have I any last question? During the tour, I mentioned about the radiation exposure. So I was wondering if during uh, whatever you were in contact with the radiation, you have to take certain breaks or um, you know, the universe time before I went to the exposure. And one of the questions I've asked before, answered before, have I was already answered. Yeah. Um, right, I um, just would like to say on behalf of King School of Barsha, a massive thank you. Can you turn off, Doug? A massive thank you on behalf of King School of Barsha. The talk. Um, there was a, I, we could go on for another two hours with the questions that are lines up, but I know that you guys are busy and these have got to get back and actually learn. So, Kings, can we have a massive round of applause? Thank you very much, and we are we are also very happy to be with you this this morning. And it was great to hear so many questions. Exactly. Always stay curious. I think asking. we reached our aim. Yeah. yeah we involved the audience, and that was that was yeah. really really cool. Yeah, I'm All gonna right. say on just I'm at the very end because a couple of our our physicists are actually applying for um for university and will be the future use. They're going to stay back because they want to speak to you directly. So our six formers, okay. if they're seeing if you can just stay back at the very end. Um, guys, go to your lesson. I've emailed all your teachers that you are late to class. You go straight there. Thank you so much. Thank you. Ciao, Thank ciao. You. Give me a wave and you Taking, taking you guys the big screen. Okay. Right, guys. Be, be oh, no. <laughs> no. oh, I'm sorry. Because I had you on the big screen, so I might have found another question right now. Everything's funny with TikTok. Uh, sorry, I took you off the big screen. Like a phone screen. Same, same as system? Same as system. Same as system. Same as system. Okay. Hello? Videos. Oh, God. Oh, you know, I'm going to pull you back in. I took it off thinking I was being good. Oh, sorry, 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 sorry. I was muted. I was muted. Yeah. <laughs> it was our fault. Hi, can yeah. you hear us now? As usual. I, I love <laughs> to have my fault. Well, first of all, thank you so much. That was really amazing and kind of inspiring. <laughs> all of us, uh, we all take physics. Yeah, yes. And uh, we all want to go into <laughs> some sort of engineering. I don't know about you. Computer science and then maybe. Yeah, software engineering. Yeah. That's yeah. Software engineering, so... It's really, really uh, exciting. Would it be okay if we got your names? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, of course. Of course, of course. Um, do you have a chat?
Can you write the uh, actually, I'm, I'm going to put, oh, Indica, put this on the, this is also on the Indico. And also I'm going to, to put this recording, you know, that we are in recording now. I'm going to put it on the, on the YouTube. And I will mark always, actually I am doing it, always marking the name of the, of the, the participants there. So you will you will see. But by the way, she's Adelina, she's Carolina, wow. I'm Zoltan. <laughs> and Noemi is somewhere. She's yeah, working she, she's already. just gone. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it so, might be so the index page that Robin, I guess she will share with you, has our names. At least in my case, my last name is very funky. So I, I'm not sure if I can spell it out to you, but it will be written. Mine as well. Yeah, all of us. We're from <laughs> all around the world. So we have all the strangest <laughs> names. Uh, but it will be in the index page. You can find it yep. there. Perfect. I had just one last question. Is there any way you'd recommend we keep up with um, the research that's coming out of CMS? Um, any main place where the things that are being published by CMS are coming out or platforms that we can keep? Chaco. Yes. So first of all, CMS has social media. There's Instagram. I think there's Twitter. There's lots of things. But if you want to learn specifically about different types of uh, the publications we have here, CMS actually have these type of physics briefings. Um, and what, what would be the best way to find those? I guess just Google CMS physics briefing. Um, and it's essentially whenever, not always, but often when we publish a paper, uh, some of the authors get together and they write kind of like a small blog post that's kind of written in a language which suits better to the general public, but also for people who are, you know, studying physics in the kind of like uh, at university level. And it teaches you about the things that was published in this publication, um, but more uh, 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 towards the uh, general public. Yep. So I would say those are really great ways yep. to learn and, about. And that, uh, the other day I just came across on, on the LinkedIn with this. So we are we are on all the social network channels. Yeah. You will find us. So if you just type CMS, you will definitely find us. Uh, and of course, as what we just, uh, I think we were just a little bit shy to, to, to mention, but we are publishing real physics papers as well mm -hmm. in the leading physics papers of, of the, the globe. And they should all be open, right, in the sense that anybody have access to them. At least there should be some of them open. Mm -hmm. This is a this is a kind of a motion today that that uh, from these paid publications we try to go towards the 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 open things yeah. for obvious reasons. And in yeah. these physics briefings, uh, I think there should always be a link to the paper that is related yeah. to that physics briefing. So I think that's a great place to start to kind of get first like a simplified version of what was discussed in the paper, and then the link to the paper in case you're interested to learn more. And on each physics paper at the end we have the references for the other physics papers so <laughs> so this is really like a spider net that you you pick it at one point yeah. and then you can uh, slightly or, or slowly working down to the really to the others that's why it is so interesting <laughs> so much i think we're getting kicked out of the audience <laughs> <laughs> This assembly coming in. Yeah, I'm gonna have okay, to. Okay. All right. Well, so, it was nice to meet you. Yeah, yeah it's very nice to meet you. Yeah, yeah. Maybe bye bye. Email, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. That was brilliant. I know it's been longer than plans. Right, I'll oh, let you go. Glad you enjoyed. Yeah, really glad. Yeah. You enjoyed. Have a nice day. Have a nice day. Ciao, ciao. Bye. Thank you. Bye.